We are so glad that you are here in the house of God, wanting to hear more about the person of God. And we know that his spirit is among us. And he's among us in a special way. And uh, what, what I wanted to just introduce us with is this idea of um, what is Jesus really into? You know, if Jesus is always the answer, which he is, it's, that's still safe. From Sunday school to like when we gather, Jesus is always the answer to everything. My question is, like, what is he really up to? What is his heart's desire? Well, it hasn't changed, guys. It hasn't changed. Check this out. Quote. You know, we love quotes. I've got a quote from Jesus. If you're familiar with the Bible, it would be called a Bible verse. If you're not familiar with the Bible, it's from this guy, Jesus. Who, however you've come in today, that's cool. But let's start with Jesus. Here's his quote. Ready? We can get, get that first slide up there. I think we'll, we'll take care of it. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Let's go to that next slide, please. I think it, I think it might be that one. It's good for you. Nope, might be the third one. We're going to get it. Keep going. Go ahead, keep going. There it is. Look at that. I knew it was there. Jesus. Sometimes it's cool to like see, like, this is, this is Jesus. He's a person. So I, don't, I don't know about you, but maybe, maybe you, you check out when you see scripture references just sometimes because you're like, oh, I know that. Oh, that's where in Luke he says it. But I want you to remember something. Jesus is a person who is alive today. Just as much as me, as a matter of fact, he doesn't, he doesn't, um, he, he's got his, 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 uh, his new body, his resurrection body, so, so he's, he, there's a sense where he's experiencing life greater than I am, and I'm going to experience it one day when he comes back, but what I want you to understand is that he is a real person desiring a real relationship with you, and here's his heart. This is, he, he made really clear, this is what I'm doing. The Son of Man came to seek and save the law. So we're about to head into this new series called Greater. Can you read that? Yeah, right. All the 40 year olds and under got that. If you, <laughs> the rest of you are like, I can't. Why do they make something so small? Greater invitation. I'm over 40, by the way, so I can say that. So what we're going to do is we're going to be spending weeks on this idea of um, evangelism. And I don't know what you think about evangelism. I don't know what your conceptions of evangelism are. But maybe we'll affirm those or maybe we will undo those and introduce you to a new concept as it pertains to sharing the gospel of grace. Uh, so we're going to look at different styles and things like that. And, and some of you are going to be, you, you, you might find your style along the way of this series. Because some people share the gospel. Some people share about the, the death and resurrection of Christ and the life that is available in Christ through their own story. Like, they love telling their story, and that's how they share the gospel, and that's super awesome. We'll look at that. And some people love to do it in a more um, direct and even, even um, like, di there's, there's dialogue there, and they like facts and figures, and they like the history of the Bible. And so so we, can, we can take a look at a, a bit more of a confrontational style, and, and we'll look at where does prayer fit in, and, and how is it that, that prayer is such a big part of, of inviting people to the person of Jesus. But what I want you to understand is that that's really what evangelism is. Evangelism is learning how to invite people to the person of Jesus. It's not a canned presentation. It's not something you memorize. It's not something you pop open when you think, this is my chance. It is an invitation to the God who loves and wants to renew all things. It is an invitation to experience God's love. And that's what we're going to be looking at both today and over the next um, couple, couple weeks here. And we're, we're a church that uh, we're, we're kind of under a, a, a two-year vision, if you will. We're calling it Vision 2020, and we're believing that uh, this is, God's given us some clarity over what he wants us to do. We're just going to simply join Jesus, okay? It's, it's really awesome when you're, when you're trying to lead a church to just do what Jesus did. You're pretty safe there. So Vision 2020 is all about let's just do what Jesus did. And we want to see, we want to see people get saved. We want to see people get baptized. And so we have this desire um, to see the, the amount of Christ followers, at least that, 
that we have kind of like have, have in our area double, if you will. And so what we did is we like, well, how many people did we baptize a year ago? We're like, well, what if we took two years and we tried to double that? What if God just said, hey, well, well, we're going to double that? And so we're looking and we're believing that God's going to bring 200 people over the next two years. We're already a year in that are going to be baptized, which for us would be like doubling that number. And, and we're actually just crazy. I'm not really a numbers guy. Mitch has always got to like make sure my, I'm correct on that. But it's like it's, like it's happening. <laughs> it started last January and it's, it's, it's happening. We're, we're baptized. We're seeing God be like incredibly faithful and generous to us in this pursuit. And so what we want to do is we want to, we want to talk about this more. We want to equip you. We want to give you some actual tools because you might want to do this but not know how. You, you, might, you might have a great desire to do it, but you're like, man, it would really help if I had some equipping on how to enter into those conversations and what that looks like and what do I say when they, when they ask this or when they do that. And, and man, that, that's what we want to do. As the church body, we want to spend some time equipping and looking at how, how God did that, how some other people do that, and how that might play out uh, for you guys. Uh, there, there's another quote here, and, and it's not Jesus, so let's, let's reel it down, and, and, and I'm not even sure that uh, I agree with the fullness of this quote, because it's always about the glory of God. When we're sharing our faith, it's always about, all of life is always about making much of the name of Jesus and glorifying God. But I love what this guy, Leslie Newbigin, has to say. It, it stirs my affection. He says this, the deepest desire for mission, going out, sharing the faith, seeing the gospel advance, is is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is, on the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. I love hanging out with lost people and sharing Jesus with them because I know Jesus is there. I know that's where he hangs out. If you want to be with the treasure of your heart, if you love being with Jesus, be with lost people, love them, and talk to them about Jesus because that's where he hangs out. That is where he is. I I love this. It stirs my affection because, you know, when I was a kid, my dad took me to work. Did anybody's dad take them to work? Anybody grow up and your dad was taking you to work? Cool, cool, cool. So my dad didn't have... Um, like the most exotic job ever, okay? If you know my dad, he still has the same job, and it's pretty awesome for South Florida, but it wasn't like we were like flying fighter jets or like he worked for the Red Sox and I was like bat boy. My dad, he, he manufactures shuffleboard equipment and, he, and he, he works on the courts, okay? So he like gets down on his hands and knees and he like paints the courts that the, the sometimes older generation loves to, they get their shuffle on, okay? That's what my dad does. And that's what he's done forever. And b- being that we live in, you know, East, South Florida, it's a good place. To, he, you know, he, not a lot of people do it. So he's kind of like the shuffleboard czar or whatever you want to call him. You know, he's got, he doesn't have a full monopoly on it, but whatever. He's, he's done it for years and it's provided really awesome for our family. And so I didn't really care about shuffleboards. I still don't. I mean, if it comes up, we might take a picture and be like, Bobby, double board. But we, we're not, none of us like really played it. We didn't get college scholarships for it. We don't sit around talking about the discs and how you, how you manufacture the equipment. Here's what I loved. Simply getting to be with dad. I wasn't even really good when I went to work for dad. He would pay me sometimes in wages and sometimes in like happy meals. It didn't matter to me because I'm talking about from like early on. I mean, I don't, I don't actually know the, the age. Of, I'm talking about probably pre-10 years old into my adolescence. I spent a ton of time going to work with dad and I loved it because I got to be with dad. He would go before me oftentimes, set the work up. He would walk next to me, correct what I messed up, and then he would go behind me. I'm certain, I don't know this for sure, but and fix what I what I totally messed up. (laughs) And then we would get to look and say, wow, wasn't that beautiful? And we go on to the next job. Yeah, what's that? And dad loved it too. That's my dad right there, by the way. Can we give him a hand? Any shuffleboard cord needs, there he is, right there. You got the czar in your presence. (laughs) 
It's like I wasn't even very good at it. But I loved it and he loved it. I think of evangelism like that. Man, I just want to be with Jesus. I just want to be where he is. I know he's probably gone before me. I know he'll walk beside me and I know he'll clean up my mess. And then we'll both get to look and be like, man, that was awesome. But you know what was even better? Being with you. Being with you. I don't know. It's pretty amazing when people get saved too, so they're both wins. I want to talk about our place at the table before we, before we look at our passage. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 15, so you can go ahead and turn there. Our place at the table, it's important for us before we enter in and talk about what this is going to look like to understand that we have a, we have a place at the table, but it's not what it used to be. It's not what it used to be. Um, maybe if you were to go back, I don't know, 50 years, our place at the table as people who hold out the, the gospel of grace was different. For instance, when, when you said the word, hey, hey, this is my pastor or this is my church, it, it, it had, a, it had a, like an authority and a value and a weight and an honor that it doesn't necessarily carry today in our culture. It's like, this is my church, so? It has nothing to do with me. This is my pastor, really? Well, like, has, had, did he steal money? Did he cheat on his wife? Like, like where, where's, the, where's the controversy there? You know, like, like there, there's, there's not the same place that, that people of faith and institutions of faith carry as they did 50, 75, 100, 200 years ago. This is our reality, okay? And so when we sit down at the table and we start talking about this is truth, Although it is, we have to realize that, that we don't carry the same space that we once did. And so it's important for us never to compromise the truth, but to always understand our place at the table. Because if we come in and think that this is just the majority, the Judeo-Christian view is just a great starting place, and we can just immediately start talking about sin and Jesus and your need for forgiveness, you, you will not most likely be heard. You'll, you'll come to the table, but you'll be in one of the chairs that quickly gets dismissed because you haven't realized your place. Do you know that Jesus realized his place? When he would enter into situations... He realized his place, and then he realized how he would enter the situation in a, in a radically loving and relevant way. He, he read the scene. He read the times. People of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, the early church, they understood their place. This is not better or worse. It's just, hey, let's be wise and understand our place. A few thoughts about our culture here today. And, and, and understanding our place. Let me just talk about our culture. It's a rapidly changing culture, is it not? I mean, there, we're, we're constantly on to the next new thing. Like, like this iPhone, although it keeps me on track somewhat of, of when to end, is, is becoming obsolete as we speak. Right? It's like, boom, so, something. We are in a rapidly change. We've got people who sign with the Raiders. Anybody? No? It's a couple, a couple of you guys with and then, like, within 24 is over here with Bill Belichick, and who knows how that's going to work out. But it, like, rapidly changing culture. We're in a post-church culture, and I kind of explained that. Like, the church used to be the institution that defined, well, this is how life should look. What does the church have to say about that? We still have the definition for how life should look. It's just that we don't have the same place that we did. And when you think that we do, it comes across as arrogant and misinformed about the world that God has called us to love and become relevant in. Never mistake a desire to be relevant and contextual with a compromise of the scripture. It's just loving people well and loving the world that you've been called to be missionaries in well. Uh, we're a very, uh, there, there's this um, relativism. It's like, well, that's, that's cool for you, but not necessarily for me. So you can have your thing and I'll have my thing and, and we, can, we can coexist and not, and not mess with each other too much. That's, a, that's, a, that's like a core value 
of our, of our world. Um, we're a mobile world and, and transient. So people are here for a couple years and then they get transferred in their job and they go here and they go there and, and, and it's, there's, there's a lot of mobility now that wasn't there before. Um, there's, this, there's this pluralistic love where, where, where the fact is there is a table and there actually still is a seat for Christians at the table. Because in a pluralistic society, you know, like everyone gets a seat, at least theoretically. That, that seat is becoming less and less and the margin is becoming more and more our reality. And, and you know, it's okay to realize that because Jesus flourished in the margins. He never needed the spotlight to change the world. But it's important to realize we're in a pluralistic place. We're in a place of secularism. And, and, and there's, there's this idea of like um, what's flat and can be seen and touched and tasted. I mean, that's a, that's a really big deal. And yet even though we have this, uh, the culture around us has this desire for things to be horizontal, there's still this longing in our heart for, for something mysterious and transcendent. That's why people love art. It's why like the arts garage flourishes in Delray. It's why Friday night concerts are, are amazing here in Delray because people still want to be wooed by something that's hard to explain. We live in a, a, a highly comparative society where I'm comparing your post with my post and how many likes you have with how many likes I have and what, where you're living and, and we're, we're looking and we have access to one another's lives and so that, that increases the comparative nature. Hey, hey listen. This is, not a, I'm not, this is not a condemning, this is, this is just saying, this is the world we live in. And so let's be wise and loving as we enter this world equipped with the context into which God has sent us. Because it'll be a different context for the kingdom students and a different context for the kingdom kids. But what we're going to talk about today is a model that actually applies in all contexts because it's the way that God approaches us. So let's turn your Bibles to, to Luke 15 and um, begin to understand that we're not going to be talking about uh, like another gospel like program. Uh, there's no, we don't have tracts being given out. This, this isn't um, uh, like an, another resource. Uh, this isn't a, like a, a new type thing. This is a pattern that we're going to be looking at. Now throughout this, throughout this series, we will, we will talk about a tool we're going to talk about a tool in the midst of this series that might be helpful to some of you. But, but today is, is like this is the pattern that works because this is how God approaches us over and over again. And um, uh, it, it, can be, it, it can be seen in, in what you might know as the prodigal son. Um, it, calling this, this, this message invitational God. Invitational God. And um, it, it's about a God who invites us in. It's, it's really the way of God. And so, um, you know, we're going to be doing a, a, a bit of a deep dive on a few verses there, but uh, we're, we're in Luke 15. And, and let me set up the story for you, uh, because Jesus here, he comes in and, um, you know, he's, he, he's been talking about the kingdom. He's, I mean, he, there was three aspects to Jesus's ministry. There was a, a teaching, a preaching, and a, and a healing aspect. You know, he did other things as well, but those were kind of his three cornerstones. And, um, and then he would tell these parables, parables. And a parable is like a story that had, a, had like a main point. And you weren't supposed to look at every detail of the parable and try to have these huge implications of it. It was just like, hey, I'm trying to teach a, a complex thing in a simple way. And so he told stories. If you love telling stories, that's how Jesus thought. He loved telling stories. And as a matter of fact, many of you probably don't remember any of the points of most of the messages that have been preached here, but you know what you remember? Me talking about going to work with my dad. You know what you remember? That time I talked about, you know, uh, when I had a conversation with Cade, or, or, or that time when Pastor John talked about something here. Like, like we, we, we love story. We connect with story, and so that's important. As, as you think about how we begin to share the, the gospel and God's story and invite people into that. Well, in Luke 15, Jesus is telling stories and he's talking to the, to the people about God's heart for the lost and how God loves to see lost people get saved. See, here's, here's the situation, right? 
when we were born, all of us were born into this world in a broken state. Like, we did not have a right relationship with God. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say that we, we were born as an enemy to God because we had a sin nature. And God's perfect and holy and just, and he can't be around that. There's nothing that he can, it would, it would like compromise his essence if he just was like, ah, oh, he's a sinner, no big deal. He had to do something about it, but he was deeply in love with us. And so there was, a, there was like an issue, there was a problem, there was something that needed to be redeemed. And so God, in his love for you and his love for me, he's like, I'm not going to leave them in that state separated from me in their sin. I'm going to go get them. And this is how I'm going to go get them. God the Son, Jesus, came to earth, and he lived the life that you and I could never live, perfect, with no sin of his own. So he was the acceptable sacrifice to go to a cross and be punished for your sin. My sin was placed upon him. And the penalty that I deserve, the separation that I deserve, Jesus experienced. And he died, and on the third day, he beat it. Whenever you sing that in a song, you should get crazy wild, by the way. If we ever sing about the king is alive, clapping, yelling, screaming is appropriate, okay? Some of you who are new here don't come from that background. It's not a background. It's just like your king is alive, yo. Like he overcame sin and death so that you now can too. That's a bigger deal than the NFL today. It's a bigger deal than your job promotion. It's a bigger deal than the healing you're waiting for. It is the longing of your heart. Okay, so Jesus, he did that. He overcame our sin and death. And then he's like, you can, you can have what I have if you'll simply just come and receive it by faith. If you'll turn from your self-saving acts and just believe that I'm enough and what I've done for you is enough, just receive me as your savior. Look to me as your treasure, as, as your life. Take that step of faith that I am enough and you get all the goods and more of what he promises in his gospel. How does God make that relevant to us? How does he invite us into that? Well, Jesus was telling stories about the fact that God's heart was for the lost and to, to share that message. In this particular story, I think there's a model given as well. And it's not just in this story, it's in all of Scripture. But in this story, there's a young son who, who wants his inheritance from his father. There's two boys, and um, one is like super rule follower, and the other one is rule breaker, and, and they both need the father. If you're here today and you're a rule follower or you're a rule breaker, you both need the father the same amount. One of you just looks a little better, but probably more prideful. I'm not saying which one. Since God saved me from being the older brother, I can just out myself that. So the younger brother takes his stuff, and he goes. He, he takes his inheritance. He goes, and then he blows it, and he ends up, like, losing it all. He's trying to find life outside the father, and it doesn't work, and he ends up feeding pigs, and he's just, he's just a wreck, dude. He's just a total, total wreck. And then he realizes, like, man, maybe, maybe my dad would take me back as, like, a servant. Maybe I could slide in that way. And so um, in verse 20, I think that's where we'll pick it up. Is that what we got? And he arose, this is the, the younger son, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. While he was still a long way off, his father ran to him. His father showered him with inappropriate affection for that culture. This is a culture where dad didn't run and where dad didn't shower son with affection. It, it, that was not kind of like the norm. And, and here's the picture, right? Here, here, here's the picture. Dad is still at home, okay? Dad is still, but he's on, he's on the lookout. His heart is for the lost son. And as soon as he sees the son coming, dressed well, smelling good with a couple of Bibles and a few commentaries under his arm and, and with some like disciples behind him and this, this like radiant Shekinah glory glow. Um, he, the father then, you don't know what Shekinah glory is, that's cool, it's just like a biblical, like, like he got all cleaned up. Then the father comes to him, right? After the son was like super like reformed and and everything had worked out, and he had worked his steps and gotten a sponsor, and he was, like, speaking at meetings, and um, 
he had completely quit looking at porn, and um, he was, uh, you know, uh, super generous. And uh, no, 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 dude, you don't understand. <laughs> you don't understand our God, okay? Bear with me for a second. Some of you don't like it when I do this, and that's okay. I just, I got to do it real quick. You, like, we think that God was, was ready to receive the son when he was here, like front row. And, and he had his, and some notes, and he was like engaged. No, you don't understand. The, the son is like here. Okay, I'm not saying anything bad about you people back here, by the way. This is not a commentary about if you sit back here. But the son is barely in the building. And he comes in, and he stinks. He smells like the life that he's just tried to escape, but he can't find victory with. And he brings that life with him. He brings the stench. He brings the reality with him. And God doesn't wait for him to get up here and walk through the aisles and get cleaned up with some Bible study. No, no, no. The father runs and showers him with affection and kisses him and brings him in. And it's like, man, so good to see you, my son. He gets them back there, not up here. And he kisses them, and he embraces them, and he immediately reminds him that you belong to me, even back there. And the passage doesn't end there. Check this out. Next verse. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So the, so the son had this speech, right? He's like, I'm going to, have you ever prepared a speech? I remember breaking curfew, coming home, and my prayer was like, I forget, like, like something like, God, don't let me get in that much trouble. Weird prayers happen when you're like preparing for wrong, right? So the son's got this speech, and he comes in, and he's like, all right, dad, here's the deal. I know I totally messed up. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I get it. I'm out of the family, and there's no way I can get back in. I totally get that. Next slide. Please. The father cuts him off. You ever been cut off and felt like it was rude? Like, dude, that person just cut me off. The son didn't feel like that. It was as if the father began to, to let the son speak, and then, you know, like, just, just put his hand to his mouth. and was like, shh. Has God ever just shh, 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 you'd, have you ever experienced God just shh, 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 maybe even now with where your thoughts are, what's going on in your heart? It's just like shh, 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 shh. bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Here's the deal. He's not going to bring him in the way he found him. Watch this. Watch it. He's like, immediately, I am decking you out in all that you'll ever need. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the best, I'm not just going to get you a robe and let you earn better robes along the way. He's like, I'm giving you the best that I got. I'm giving you the best robe, and you need, it's going to be put on you. I'm going to give you a ring for your hand and shoes for your feet. So it's like, it's like he's, he's getting his identity back. It's like these are things that belong to the family and go to family members. These don't go to anybody. The, yes, right. <laughs> Who is that, Paisley? All right, she do, she's doing great back there. She's like my only amen Or You know you can join Paisley if you want. If you, like, if you hear something, it's totally cool, Okay. These are things that belong to the family, guys. The father wasn't doling these out as if it was a thrift shop. This was the best robe. This was a ring that was costly to the father, that belonged to the father and his family. This was shoes so that the son was going to be actually doing something different, certainly. (laughs) It was like, man... I'm going to redress you so that you never forget your mind. Your mind. And I want you just as you are. 
I'll take care of the new clothes. I'll take care of the ring. I'll take care of the shoes. You, you just come. Next verse, please. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. There's going to be a big party. We're going we're to go all in for this. Why? For this son was dead. You know, he wasn't physically dead, right? The father, the father knew he wasn't physically dead. He was, he's, he's, he's in front of him. He, he, he didn't die physically. What, what, he, what he's talking about, he was dead because he was separate from me. That's spiritual death. When you're separate from the Father, you are dead spiritually. That's how we were all born. And when you come to a place of receiving the invitation of the Father from the back row, this is what happens. You become alive again because of your presence with the Father, because of the way he clothes you in his stuff, not yours. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. What I want to look at in our time remaining is the moves of the Father here and apply them to how you share the gospel. You have an outline if you're an outline person and there's, some, there's going to be some blanks and things like that to, to, follow, to, to, to fo- follow in and write in if you want to do that. But it's going to kind of help, help walk us through. If not, we're just going to keep going. So he, there's this idea that I want us to get our minds around because it's the pattern that God gives us. And here it is. Love, no Speak, do. This is the pattern of the way that God approaches us. This is the pattern of the way that we should approach people. No matter what your style of evangelism might be, no matter how you want to share the gospel, which is very personal to you, this, is, this pattern works all the time. This is the pattern of this parable. It's also the pattern of the story of God. He loved us and entered our world. Then he knew us and dwelt among us. Then he spoke gospel truth that was meaningful to where we were. Then he decided that he would do life as we became the people that he'd called us to be. That's the the overarching part of God's story. It's it's how he's he's ushering in his love to us. And so let's take a look at at some of these in greater detail. So first of all, love, love. When when we start talking talking about uh, um, sharing the gospel, this is what should come to mind. Love, no speak, do. That picture, can we go back one slide, please, to that picture? That's a great posture for sharing the gospel. You see that right there? Right here, this one. Sometimes you think of sharing the gospel like this. Or if I'll just get him to church, crazy Casey will share the gospel with them. Or sometimes we think about it like, you know, we're having this like intellectual debate. I'm going to argue them into the kingdom. Or sometimes we think like, I can, I can, I'm going to share some truth, but then I'm going to get back to the way I want to live over here. That's the most beautiful way to share God's truth because this is how he shares it with us over and over and over again. Let's look at some of these. Love. Um, so, so we see from the passage that, that, that love is like a, a gospel movement. Again, it's, it's, right, it's right there in, in, the, in the parable. Um, he ran, he embraced, and he kissed the son. Those are verbs of the father. And what they indicate is that the father didn't wait for the, for the lost son to enter his world. He went to him. He entered his world. He's the one who ran to the son, left his place of comfort. He's the one who got dirty, who got the stench on him. He's the one who, who invaded that space rather than waiting over here until the son felt comfortable enough to come to his world. So our first move as we think about sharing the gospel, we think about friends who don't know Jesus, we think about uh, people that we want to see experience the grace of God and come to life with a king that's alive, your first move should be to think about how can I enter their world? What, what is their world and how can I enter into it? Maybe it's a sports world. Uh, maybe it's a, a world of, you know, they love to go out to eat. Maybe it's a world of academics. Uh, maybe it's a world of politics. Maybe it's a world uh, where, where they're a teacher and everything revolves around their students. It doesn't matter. It's awesome. Your first move is how can I lovingly enter into that world and become a part of what they care about? 
before I hope that they start caring about the things that I care about. So our, our blank here is, is people need a place to belong. Let that be your first move of the gospel. People need a place to belong. Let me give credit where credit is due here. Dr. Paul Tripp, author, writes about love, no speak, do in, in, in ways that we counsel one another in community. This, be very, this has been very helpful to us as we think about sharing the gospel. I think it applies to all of life. People need a place to belong. It's almost like there's this, there's this struggle that sometimes we face and people probably feel. And here's the struggle. Are you ready? Um, uh, it's a struggle between a place of belonging versus a place of being all in. I want you to understand that people don't have to be all in for the gospel for you to create a safe place for them to belong. Are you, are you with me on that? Okay. That doesn't mean they're, they're going to be preaching next Sunday if they don't know Jesus. Like that, I'm not talking about elevate. I'm talking about you, you can belong. You can be a part. You, get, you, you can be a part of this church family. You can be a part of my family. I can be a part of your family. I'm creating a place for us to have relationship at the onset before I'm giving you information. How many of you, by show of hands, who, who came to faith here or around, around your time at the Avenue Church first found a place of belonging before you found a place of belief? Just raise your hands. Your first move here at the Avenue Church was that you were able to belong to this place and, and, and be, a, be a part of things. This was a, a safe family for you. It's important, guys. It's important. I did some I, educational work about two years ago, and I did a study uh, about, about, I've told you some of this, uh, sobriety and how the local church can help uh, pe people sustain their sobriety. And one of the thing, one of the main fightings was that people needed a place to belong. And in the interview process, I interviewed a guy who talked about being able to come to this church in sweat pants. He's like, it's all I had. I was in, I was in a halfway house and I didn't like, he was kind of struggling, can I come? Can I? And they were like, man, yeah, you can come. Put your sweats on, dude. Let's go. If you were with us last week, I actually preached in sweatpants, so there you go. People need a place to belong. They're going to find it outside of you and the gospel. We see cults. We see gangs. We see all sorts of places to belong because people long for that. Let's give them a place to belong as we continue the process. Next one is no. No. In this particular parable we see that the, that the father let the son speak first. When we think about sharing the gospel, oftentimes we're thinking about speaking. But what I want us to do, I want us to first think about listening. Listen first. If you're going to be an effective gospel sharer, if you're going to be on mission with God and seeing people go from death to life, you are going to need to increase your proficiency as a listener not in your rehearsed speech. Gospel listening is how we love people and know their story and have any clue as to where the gospel will make sense to them. In this particular parable, the father let the son speak first, even though the son had this gibberish speech prepared. This is a place for us to be great question askers and not only enter people's world, but then enter their story by, by knowing them first by listening to them, by asking well-informed questions about who they are. And in that process, you will get to hear some of the desires and the longings and the pain points of their heart where the gospel will make way more sense than maybe it's ever had before. People need to be known is the blank and loved. They need to be known and loved. You know that people are longing for this, or else Instagram and Facebook wouldn't be so popular. I want you to know me, and so I'm going to post about my life, but I only want you to know parts of my life. I'm not going to post about the day I had yesterday where it took me all day, and I just ended up falling asleep trying to get present and remove like a little bit of like a, a not a little bit, like a cloud of darkness. I didn't take my picture and post that. I was believing Jesus, I was asking for his help, I, I was like growing in confidence. I was actually at this conference, and it was all about confidence in Christ. And I, like two days of it was awesome, and yesterday it was just like, man, it was just like heavy. 
I wasn't like, heavy day, click. <laughs> Hope you can relate. <laughs> well, I might post about my son's home run, or I might post about this, or my vacation, or this, or that. I mean, I don't really have a Facebook account or Instagram. I kind of post for the church. And I don't do a ton of low points for the church. Hey, we messed up here. Let me get that shot. People want to be known, but they want to be known on their accord. But you know what begins to radically transform people? When they get known fully and loved fully. Then people begin to pay attention to what's going on. You actually know me and still love me? Okay. How do you do that? What is it about you that allows for you to do that? Number three, speak. Speak. Um, I'm going to call the team up. I know we're, we're getting ready to close here. Speak. The father speaks, and when he speaks truth to the son, what does he say? Bring quickly the best robe. Bring the ring. Bring the feet. You see, the son was suffering from shame and identity. He, the son didn't know who he was. He had come back and he thought he was going to be a servant. And he was certainly embarrassed about what he had done. And so he was struggling with shame and identity. And what the father doesn't do is talk to him about the gospel of, of, of other things. He applies the gospel directly to his shame and his identity. Here's what I mean by this. Tim Keller says the gospel is like a diamond and you can spin it. And as you spin it, you can see different like prisms of the gospel, all of which are true, that belong to the diamond. There's the gospel of adoption, where you're adopted into a new family in Christ. There's the gospel of forgiveness, where you no longer have to carry guilt. There's the gospel of newness, where you are a new creation in Christ. Those are different themes of the gospel. And here's the point. We need to steep ourselves and saturate ourselves in the gospel of grace so much so that when we hear a person's story and we've loved them and we know them, we can now apply the gospel that makes the most sense to them. So this dude was struggling with shame and identity. And what does the father do? He covers him and then he puts a ring on his finger. He's like, you're covered and you're mine. It's a gospel that was attached and applied to his reality, not just the father's. And finally, do do. Prayer team, if you want to come up, we're going to, we're going to get ready to, to close here and respond in song. The father invites the son into the family again. He says, and they began to celebrate. He, he was going to have a feast. Do you know what happens at a feast? Especially in this culture? People don't eat in the corner. People come together. And, and one of the main points of the feast is that we get to be together as a family and that's what the father does he doesn't say son I'm going to set up a TV tray for you outside and you can eat your meal out here until you feel better about yourself or until you're doing a little bit better he's like no you're coming in and we're going to do family we're going to do family as I help you watch this we're going to do family as I help you to keep on the rope because you know what the younger son's propensity is probably going to be? To run again. Take off the robe, lose the ring, because it's all so new to him and overwhelming. And that's why the son needs a family. He doesn't need another program. He doesn't need another resource. He needs a family that will create a safe place for him to become what God has called him to become. think about love, we think about people who need a place to belong. As we think about knowing, man, people, they need to be known and loved. As we think about speaking, you know what people need? They need Jesus. They need Jesus. 
they don't need your best speech. They don't need all the arguments and they don't need another like thing thrown at them. If you're going to invite them to something, please, 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 you can invite them to parts of the family. You can invite them to church. Those are all, all good family things. But please, would you please, don't invite them to me. You gotta invite them to the person of Jesus right where they are. They don't even need to come in here. Jesus lives in all of his believers, so invite them to the person that has radically changed you and let him clothe them. Let him put a new ring on their finger. Let him do the work that only he can do. And as we sing and close, I want to invite those of you who have never received Christ to come and, and feel the presence of a God who is inviting you right where you are in the midst of all that you brought in to the person of Jesus. He wants to clothe you, he wants to forgive you, and he wants to give you a new family. And you do that simply by faith and repentance, turning from yourself to this God who has Jesus for you. But we're going to sing this last song, man, and, and I would love to invite anyone who needs that person of Jesus, but especially those of you who need to come home. Man, you come home today and receive the Father's touch. Let's sing. So, Father, just in this moment of worship and prayer, Lord, I love that you're a God that, that takes us as we are and in your love refuses to leave us there. So God, I pray that if there's anyone who needs to come to you, that they can just tell you that right where they are. Father, I gotta come to you now. I'm tired of where I've been living. And I am believing for the first time that you don't want me as, a, as, as, a, as like a, somebody who's gonna stay outside the house. But God, you want me as a son and as a daughter. And you can take me in because of what Christ did for me. I believe that today, and I turn and receive your invitation, Father, from my former life. But I'm believing that coming to you is where life is. And so I come to you by faith. You come to him in that way, and he makes you new, clothes you, and takes you to work with him every day. Father, help us to believe these truths, whether it's for the first time or the 500th time. Make them new and fresh in our hearts and change the world with your gospel message. Now for God's people, I say, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace that we might give it to others. Christ, in your name we pray. Amen. As we leave today, we want to invite you guys to a place where family is done here at the Avenue Church. Come check out our groups. We'll have our group leaders there to talk to you about what they're doing. This is where family happens. We want you to be involved. We love you. We'll see you next week.